بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابَ فَاخْتُلِفَ فِيهِ وَلَوْلَا كَلِمَةٌ سَبَقَتْ مِنْ رَبِّكَ لَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِنْهُ مُرِيبٍ وَإِنَّ كُلًّا لَمَّا لَيُوَفِّيَنَّهُمْ رَبُّكَ أَعْمَالَهُمْ إنه بما يعملون خبير فاستقم كما أمرت ومن تاب معك ولا تطغوا إنه بما تعملون بصير ولا تركنوا إلى الذين ظلموا فتمسكم النار وما لكم من دون الله من أولياء ثم لا تنصرون وأقم الصلاة طرفي النهار وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات ذلك ذكرى للذاكرين واصبر فإن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين فلولا كان من القرون من قبلكم أولو بقية ينهون عن الفساد في الأرض إلا إلا قليلا ممن أنجينا منهم واتبع الذين ظلموا ما أترفوا فيه وكانوا مجرمين وما كان ربك ليهلك القرى بظلم وأهلها مصلحون ولو شاء ربك لجعل الناس أمة واحدة ولا يزالون مختلفين إلا من رحم ربك ولذلك خلقهم وتمت كلمة ربك لأملأن جهنم من الجنة والناس أجمعين وكلا نقص عليك من أنباء الرسل ما نثبت به فؤادك وكلا نقص عليك من أنباء الرسل ما نثبت به فؤادك وجاءك في هذه الحق وموعظة وذكرى للمؤمنين وقل للذين لا يؤمنون اعملوا على مكانتكم إنا عاملون وانتظروا إنا منتظرون ولله غيب السماوات والأرض وإليه يرجع الأمر كله فاعبده وتوكل عليه وما ربك بغافل عما تعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين 
وأصلي وأسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asking the Almighty to bless his entire household and to bless every single one of his companions and to bless every single one of us and to grant us goodness and ease. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, it brings joy to the heart to see faces, some of them we know and others, mashallah, we hope Allah unite us in paradise and we hope that the Almighty grant us ease after death in the same way that we are hopeful of ease before death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. This evening we will be speaking about the lessons derived from the lives of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I wish to dive straight into the topic because from the very beginning the Almighty had decreed upon himself not to leave mankind without a messenger or a message and not to punish mankind until and unless they were warned by the messengers or the messages of those messengers. And this is why we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran regarding sending messages and messengers. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ Indeed, we have sent to every nation a messenger to warn them to worship Allah alone and to protect themselves from الطاغوت, the devil and the evil to protect themselves from sin in order for them to understand how to worship their maker and in order for them to know what is required of them and why they have been created. So it would be purposeless for the Almighty to create us without telling us why He has made us. So in order for us to know why He made us, He sent messengers. And these messengers came about with messages from Him. And this is His way of choosing to test us. It was simple for Him having to come personally to tell us. But there would be no test of belief because belief is connected to the unseen. That which you have not seen. I did not see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but I believe in him. I did not see Jesus, may peace be upon him, but I believe in him. I did not see Moses, may peace be upon him, and the other messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I believe in them. I believe that they were sent as messengers with the message of the Almighty. And I also believe that if I were living at the time of any one of those messengers, I would have to have been their followers. So it happens to be that Allah chose for me to be created during the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's message. So I am from amongst his followers by the will of Allah. And I hope and I pray the same for all of us. And I hope and I pray the same for humanity at large. May Allah guide us all to the beauty of this deen and religion. Ameen. So beloved brothers and sisters, if you take a careful look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan, we hear the verse in the Quran where Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created mankind or jinn kind except for the fact that they worship me. That is why I made them. I have created them for them to worship me, for me to be worshipped by them. So this is the purpose of creation. One might think that this is a deep, heavy translation. So people have worded it differently, which all leads to the same translation. One of the most interesting explanations of it is, if we were to say, I have been made by my maker in order to prepare for the day I am going to meet with him, that would be very easily understood by us. Not to say that anything else is not easily understood, but sometimes the differences of understanding, sometimes the environment makes it difficult for us to understand some language and makes it easy for us to understand simple words. And for that reason we say, my brother, my sister, be focused on one thing. 
Remember, you are in this world in order to prepare for the day you will be meeting the one who made you. And that's it. Allahu Akbar. In the process, for survival in this particular world, we need to earn a living. And we need to have children. And we need to continue with the plan of the Almighty. And for that, what happens is, He has set rules and regulations governing and determining how we shall be living. And this is where the message of the messengers has come. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us countless messengers. We perhaps will never know the exact number. Some of them he has mentioned their names. And some of them he has not mentioned their names. Minhum man alayka wa minhum man alayk. From amongst the messengers are those whom we have related to you their stories. And from amongst them are those whom we have not related to you their stories. So this means there is a number that is known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only know what he has related to us. So why has he related the stories to us? Surely there must be a reason. And the verses I read before you this evening at the beginning have in them a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have indeed sent the stories of the messengers to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to start with. So firstly, the stories came to whom? They came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The authentic versions of the stories of the previous prophets have been recorded in the Qur'an. What is mentioned in the Qur'an or in the correct authentic ahadith and traditions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is enough for us to know about the previous messengers. Anything that we hear from other sources, it is not necessary for us to know this. And this is why there is something known as the Jewish narrations or the Israeliyat. There are many such narrations where people of the previous books have made mention of the issues of the previous messengers. We need to know a rule regarding these narrations. There are three types of narrations known as Israeliyat. Those that are negated by the Qur'an and Sunnah, which means the Qur'an and the Sunnah deny their correctness. Those, we throw them out. For example, there are some narrations which suggest that the Prophet Lut or Lot, may peace be upon him, was not a decent man. Astaghfirullah. So we throw that immediately out because we believe that all the messengers of the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala, were the best from amongst the people of the time. Allah would never choose an ambassador or a messenger being a person who was not fit for the post or who had dirty habits. May Allah protect us. The same applies. There is another narration that is tradition taken from the previous people or the people of the previous books. They say the Prophet Solomon or David, may peace be upon them both, were also immoral and they have some form of mention made in their changed scriptures of some evil of these two great messengers and kings sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We refute that, we deny it, we throw it out, and we believe in the innocence of these messengers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon all of them. So that is the first type of narration, that which is denied by the Qur'an. We throw those out because we don't need them and we believe they are wrong. The second type, those narrations which are confirmed by the traditions and sayings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or by that which appears in the Qur'an. Those type of traditions, we accept them, we acknowledge them, we believe in them, and we will work towards understanding the application of them, if applicable, because they have appeared in the Qur'an and the Sahih sunnah the authentic of the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we, the first category we throw out. The second category we take it because we have its teachings within our own books. And the third category... Those which they neither are denied by the Qur'an or the Sunnah, nor were they acknowledged. There is a possibility that they are true. We have a policy regarding those. لا نصدق ولا نكذب. We don't actually need those. We neither say they are correct, nor do we say they are wrong, because we do not have knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So, sometimes we hear of details of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Sometimes we hear details of his discussions with Fir'aun. If these details have come to us from sources besides the Qur'an and the authentic sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
we may read these knowing that they may be true, they may not be true. If there is a good lesson derived from them, we may derive the lesson. But if there is anything else, we can hold it at bay. Because remember, we do not need anything more than what was sent to us as Muslimin in terms of the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, every time we have made mention of the stories of the previous prophets and their nations, to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is in order to strengthen your heart, and in order to grant it comfort, and in order to solidify your heart, because you will know the difficulties they went through. You will know how their people responded to them, and you will realize that it happens to everyone. To the degree that today, when we have difficulties in our lives, my brothers and sisters, if you were to pick up the story of any messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wallahi, you will achieve comfort by reading that story and by looking at what they endured in order to fulfill the obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we cannot endure putting on headgear because we are facing perhaps difficulty from family members. Sometimes they discourage us. Sometimes the environment discourages us. In certain countries, the environment discourages us. And sometimes people mock and laugh at us. And sometimes our own Muslims look down upon us when we are trying to fulfill Islam. All that is a test. Are you worth wearing that hijab? Are you worth following the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does he come first or do those people come first? All you need to do is open up the books of the previous Prophet's stories or even the story of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And wallahi, you will see in it, he has never ever given up his principle and the teachings that he was given in order to please a human being in the displeasure of the Almighty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us. So this is the beauty of the stories of the messengers. One of the main points is for us to derive lesson. And this is why from the outset, I must let you know, that whenever you read a story of the previous messengers, never think it is just a folk tale. Never think it is a beautiful story that makes good bedtime material for my children. No, it does not stop there. You may read those stories at bedtime for your children, but the deriving of the lessons is far more important than the story itself. So if we were to read about the Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, the children will tell you, well, there was a man and he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he warned his people, they did not listen, so Allah sent them a flood, and he had to build an ark, and he was saved in the ark with a few people, and he took in a few animals, and then they lived happily ever after. That is not the story. That is only a tale now that has been converted into something that there is no deriving of a lesson from it. The people of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, he lived in their midst for so long, he reminded them and warned them. They laughed at him. They wanted to enjoy the life of this world to the degree that they forgot their maker. And they did not want to be told about the maker. So anyone who does not want to be told about his duties to the Almighty falls into the category of those people. Now we are deriving lessons. Now we are looking at how to take a lesson from the life of the Prophet Nuh. May peace be upon him. And the messenger did not give up. So this gives a lesson to those who want to remind others that even if your own children or your neighbors or your friends or anyone else that you are trying to remind to come to the path does not listen to you or they do not take heed, remember, continue in that message because Nuh alayhi salam did not give up. He was with them for more than 950 years. In fact, the Quran speaks of the message within them being 950 years. But perhaps his life was much longer than that. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا And indeed we have sent the Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam to his people. He lived in their midst for 950 years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson of enduring. It is important for us to be able to endure. When you are calling people towards the deen, they may not listen to you. Your children may have a mouthful to say, sometimes when you call them and invite them towards the deen, what happens with us, sometimes we turn to religion in our 30s, in our 40s, and we've already got children who are perhaps in their teens. And the children are not used to us being so religious. 
So for us, we found a turning point quite simple or sometimes because we were older. For some reason, we found more focus upon the turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the young children who are bombarded on a daily basis with the television, with the cartoons, with the adverts, with the adverse environment, with the malls, with the newspapers, with the school life, everyone showing their watch and their mobile phone, everyone boasting and bragging about what type of vehicle their father or driver will come and pick them up with. It is quite difficult sometimes for those children living in such a materialistic environment to be able to just digest what you only found 30, 40 years down the line. Allahu Akbar. So we need to maintain constancy and we need to be consistent and persistent. Because without persistence and without being consistent, we perhaps will not be able to succeed with our own children. So if that is the case with our own children, what do you think will be the case with the rest of humanity? We ask the Almighty to grant us goodness and to help us, to use us, to help ourselves as well as to help others. This evening I am here speaking to you, alhamdulillah. Believe me, I feel that the honor is mine. The privilege has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, we to be seated here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sole reason of listening to some form of nourishment for our soul and to be reminded to come towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This alone is a sign of the happiness and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could have been spending our evening in a different way today. We have a festive season, subhanallah. And at the same time, we have holidays in this entire region and at the same time we could have been anywhere else but we have chosen to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he make it a means of acceptance may he make it a means of turning for us and our offspring our family members and may he bless us in every single way believe me if you study the lives of the messengers you will see that nobody has ever achieved the blessings of the almighty through the displeasure of the almighty Nobody has ever achieved the pleasure of the Almighty or His blessings through His displeasure. How could we think that I need blessings in my family, but we disobey the Almighty? So take a look at what happened to the messengers. Going back to the story of Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam. He told his people, do you want wealth? Do you want health? Do you want children? Do you want abundance? Two types of children. One is you have children who are growing up, mashallah, good looking, but they are a means of burden upon their parents. That is one. We don't want that. But the other is when you have children who are a means of the coolness of your eyes, may Allah grant that to us. You look at them and you are happy. You are in old age, they look after you. They know how to strike a balance between their spouse and their parents. And they know that none should cross the lines and so on. What a beautiful gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have children who are the coolness of your eyes. So Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam told his people and this we know because he complained to Allah. You see after a long long time of calling the people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there came a time when he raised his hands and he raised them against his own people. Allahu Akbar. And from this we learn my brothers and sisters that you and I will be reminded by Allah in one way or another, either through a television program, a radio program, a CD we have in our motor vehicles, a lecture we've heard, a talk we've had with a friend, a book we've read, or whatever else Allah has chosen to get to you. We will learn, my brothers and sisters, and we will be reminded time and again. But there is a limit to the amount of reminders you will have before you are left. And the same with me. There will be reminders if I'm involved in a sin or something wrong, I will be reminded, I will be warned. Sometimes the warning comes in the form of a medical condition. Allahu Akbar. Just today I sent out a tweet saying, if a calamity brings you closer to the Almighty, it is a blessing. And if a blessing takes you further away from the Almighty or a gift takes you away from the Almighty, it is a calamity. Subhanallah. Some people, their life is happy. They found a good job, they have a good salary. They have a beautiful wife, they have lovely children. So they don't read salah, they only come for Jumu'ah and Eid. And sometimes for Jumu'ah they come late. Allahu Akbar. If that is the case, because you have so much gift, that means it is a calamity. The fact that you are living a happy life, so beautiful and so luxury, and it has drawn you away from the masjid, that itself is not a means of 
the blessings of the Almighty, it is actually a calamity on its own. So sometimes when Allah gives you a pain in your knee, and for example, a pain in your chest, and you feel you are going to die, Allahu Akbar, sometimes that is the biggest gift you could have had, because that is what might draw you closer to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, when we get closer to Allah, we will be able to achieve a greater rank of the life after death, which is everlasting. So Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, after some time, he complains. He says, oh Allah, I told my people, I called them day and night. I told them in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, in the night. I reminded them at every occasion. I told them you were one. And remember, the core message of all the messengers was to call towards the worship of Allah alone and warning them not to associate partners with the Almighty in any way. That is the gift we have. We hold fast upon it, solid grip on the issue of not associating partners with the Almighty in anything and everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. If you open the pages of the Quran, obviously in this hour, we will not be able to go through every single verse of the Quran. But if you open the pages of the Quran, take a look at Surah Al-Shu'ara, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks messenger by messenger. Messenger by messenger. كَذَّبَتْ عَادٌ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ هُودٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Those type of verses are repeated Every single messenger has uttered those words to their people. What do they mean? Allah says, the people of Hud belied him. The people of Ad, they were known as the people of Ad and they were the people of the Prophet Hud alayhi salatu was salam. May Allah's peace be upon him. They belied the messengers. Because when you belie one, you belie all of them. So if I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I believe in all the other messengers. But if someone were to disbelieve in one, they have insulted the rest of them. Because each one came with a warning or with glad tidings of another to come after him. So it has a skittle effect. The minute you drop one, all the skittles have fallen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So Allah says, remember when this messenger told his people to fear Allah. Won't you be conscious of your maker? Ala tattaqoon. How beautiful words they are. Won't you be conscious of your maker? We can repeat the same words today. My brothers and sisters, won't you be conscious of your maker? Do you know you are going to return to your maker? So instead of reading a story and saying those were the people of Hud, those were the people of Thamud, those were the people of, for example, Madian, those were the people of Nuh, and instead of saying they were warned in this way and that way, ask yourself, what have I done with the same message? Allah is saying, Ala tattaqoon, Ala tattaqoon, Ala tattaqoon. Every single time, that message is for me as well. And if I were to deny or to forget or to conveniently put aside that message and I were to ignore it, perhaps I will suffer similar punishment that they have suffered in the past. Allahu Akbar. And this is why what is of utmost importance whenever we read these stories, as I say, put yourself into the picture and ask yourself, if I were there, how would it apply to me? Allahu Akbar. One thing we definitely do know if we open the pages of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the messengers, they never sought financial assistance from anyone, nor did they want a recompense because of the message. It is a message that comes without making a payment for it. Subhanallah. Look at Surah Yasin, where the man who came from the innermost part of the city, he says, He's telling his people, why don't you follow these who are not asking any wealth from you? They are rightly guided. All they are doing is giving you the pristine, pure message, telling you to worship your maker. What can be wrong with that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May he make us from those who can make time and spend a little bit of our monies, perhaps effort and energy 
to take part in the activity that will result in our spiritual development. Many of us forget it. You know, we have a few holidays in the year. Set aside one holiday where that will be specially for your spiritual revival, subhanallah. Why is it that sometimes every holiday we think of, you know, visiting here and there and enjoying ourselves in terms of the dunya? Wallahi, if a person only thinks of enjoyment of the dunya and this world, the day they step into their graves, they will realize the great regret. And this is why the stories of the prophets have been mentioned for us to look at how the people have regretted what they did. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go and see. Go and see where they are, what they did, how they responded to us. And look at where they are today. And go and see their ruins. Allah says at the end of Surah Maryam, هَلْ تُحِسُّ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ أَوْ تَسْمَعُ لَهُمْ رِكْزًا do you feel any one of these haughty people of the past? Do you feel any one of them? Fir'aun and Qarun and the others and the people who were huge and big and the people who had more wealth and strength than us? Allah is speaking about Qarun. And Allah says, did he not know that we have destroyed before him those who had much more than him and those who were more powerful than him? Subhanallah, what might do I have today? Today we are weaker than the people of Ad and Thamud. They were huge people. Some of them carved the mountains in order to live in those mountains. How many of us have a palace which is carved by mountains? Perhaps the bricks we use are no bigger than something we can carry in our hands. My brothers and sisters, people of the past, yes, what happened to them should always be a lesson for us. And what message came from the messengers should also be a lesson for us. There is a very interesting point that we derive from the stories of the prophets. If you look at the messengers, take Lut, the prophet Lot, may peace be upon him. His people were engaged in sodomy. And homosexuality, that was one major thing they were engaged in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them warnings. And Allah explains to them, today people believe this is hereditary. Science has not proven that it is hereditary. It's just a statement made, a farce made by the environment. It is not hereditary. People say you are born that way. That is not correct either. In Islam, we do not believe that a person is born with gay inclinations. We do not believe that. But at the same time, what we do know, the environment has become so hostile. The movies are promoting that behavior. The environment and the adverts are promoting that behavior. The news and the television and the newspapers are promoting that type of behavior in the secular world. And the people are beginning to force and impose upon others to look at it as a norm. So people are now considering it a norm. Whereas the Quran, the Bible, the Torah, the Talmud and the previous books are full of explanations of how wrong it is and it was. And it will remain. And this is why a whole nation, a whole nation was warned by the messenger for a period of time in so many different ways and thereafter when they did not repent from their bad habit i'm saying one habit that they had which was bad they were destroyed in the most treacherous way which means in the most painful way and at the same time that is mentioned in all the books even in the old testament as well as in the quran with the quran having the accurate version of what occurred the reason is for us to draw lesson. Whereas in this ummah, if you take a look, we have the calamities, if I can call them, or the sins, if I can call them, of all those previous nations put into one in us. At the time of Lut, alayhi salam, they did not consume interest. At the time of Lut, alayhi salam, that was not a major issue, which means it is not made mention of those items. It is... Other items are not made mention of. One major thing is made mention of. At the time of Shu'aib, may peace be upon him. They used to cheat people in business. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُخْسِرِينَ The statement of Shu'aib to his people was, make sure you fulfill the measure correctly and don't be from amongst those who cheat and who shortchange people. So that lesson is for us. Today in the Ummah, we have people who have the problem that the people of Lut had. We have people who have the problem of the people of Shu'aib. We shortchange people in business. We don't pay people properly. We sometimes give them goods. We've hidden the defect. We sell a vehicle saying no accident damage. And we know it was damaged in the last flood. May Allah protect us. And we lie. So this is a warning for us. We have people, for example, in our midst sometimes who have cheated in the way that the people of Hud have cheated. They lived in these beautiful homes. They forgot Allah. They used to oppress one another. Some of them were Jabbarin. A Jabbar is a person who doesn't mind eradicating others all at once. And sometimes a person who has even murdered and they want to get away with it. So these type of things, one after the other, the nations were affected by one at a time. Generally, if you look at the Quran, it confirms it. Sometimes two main matters. But with us, there are so many matters that we need to deal with. And this is why all those stories are very valid for us. What I have intended to do this evening is to bring forth the lesson that we have in our lives for us that is current, now, today, relevant. And apply it in my life to say, if the people of Nuh did this, then what will happen to me if I do the same? The same thing that happened to them. Allah may grant me respite. And as I said, after a certain time, there is nothing to worry about, which means the punishment will definitely come. There is no more messages that will come. Take a look at the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. After he makes this dua that we will make mention of in a few moments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, O Nuh, nobody is now going to believe except those who have already believed. Which means he used to give them a warning every day, every morning. إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِي لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا Allahu Akbar. He says, O oh Allah, I called my people night and day. But every time I called them, it drove them further away. Allahu Akbar. How many of us, when people tell you, brother, ittaqillah. Allahu Akbar. I know the statement. You know, sometimes people tell you, ittaqillah, ya akhi. You know, fear Allah. And you say, what do you mean? You think I don't fear? Ya akhi, do not allow the statement fear Allah to make you so hateful of the person who is telling you to fear Allah. It's a good message. You know, you need to appreciate it. Sometimes when someone calls you towards goodness, brother, you know, your mu music is blasting so much. Brother, why don't you turn it off? Who do you think you are? My father hasn't told me that. This is what happened at the time of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. When, when people told them to do good, when Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam called them towards goodness, they went further away. They developed arrogance in that sin. And they did not take heed. So Allah says, we destroyed them with the flood. So Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam says, I called my people day and night, night and day. And this calling only drove them further away. They got angry and upset and they became arrogant in their message. So much so that his own son did not accept the message. So why does Allah make mention of some of the family members of the prophets who did not accept the message? To show us that guidance is in the hands of Allah. <laughs> You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not guide whomsoever you wish. We guide whomsoever we wish. And we are all knowing of who shall be rightly guided and who is rightly guided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. So, Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, from his family, there was someone, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, his father, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his uncle, for example, and various other prophets, uh, Lut alayhi salatu was salam, and Nuh, their wives, and Allah makes mention of them in the Quran. And this goes to show that sometimes we may not be able to shove guidance down the throats of people. We need to pray to Allah to guide Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. 
What a powerful supplication of the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he says, O Allah, who strengthens the heart, in whose hands lies the controls of the heart, strengthen our heart upon the deen and not away from it. And we make this dua for our offspring as well. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. The story of that Prophet is amazing. He prayed for his offspring. He prayed for his children. He prayed for his progeny. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the fact that he was concerned about his children. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ Oh Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Make the two of us, myself and my son Ismail, make the two of us submitters unto you. How many of us make a dua to Allah? Ya Allah, make me and my children submitters unto you. In order to make that dua, you need to make an effort to submit. Some of us are not submitters. You know, we follow Islam where it, where it is easy for us only. Well, we need to do better than that. Which means, where it is easy, Alhamdulillah. Where it is difficult, we still want to try and we still want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other day, I got a beautiful message on my phone. I need to share it with you. It showed a little caricature lifting weights. You know, weights which have heavy weights. I think maybe 60, 70 kilos on either side. And he's lifting weights. He says, you think you're strong? You see, the, the question is, you think you are powerful? Obviously, this is because the young people of today, they want to have big muscles, you know, and they want to be show, seen, and they want to be felt. When they greet you, you just got to say, wa alaykum as salam, you know? Because you cannot look at them anymore in the way that we used to in the past. No, big man, you got to look at him carefully. So it says, if you think you're very strong, you, you can lift, lift your blanket for Salatul Fajr, then you will be strong. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. You're strong, you want to lift, lift your blanket at Salatul Fajr. That is the heavyweight title. Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters, I thought it was a very good message. Because today, the message of the deen needs to be put forth to our children and ourselves in a way that we look at it and we really think, Wallahi, it is correct. The powerful person is, the not, is not the one who can lift 120 kilos with one hand and with his little finger. Subhanallah, no, it isn't. A powerful person is the one who can lift his blanket up for Salatul Fajr and for Tahajjud. تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا Allahu Akbar. In Surah Sajda, Allah says, speaks about these powerful believers. And Allah says, they are the ones whose sides refuse to actually lay down on those beds. They move themselves off the bed, the beddings, in order to stand up in prayer for the Almighty at night, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fearing Him and having hope in His mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. Today when you have big muscles, you're excited. You see a people today, the youth would know what I'm talking about. They have protein supplements like mad. They have protein supplements and they want to eat so many egg whites and egg yellows. I don't know how it works. And what happens? They want to build their strength of their body. Brother, read the stories of the prophets. The strength of your iman is far more important than the strength of your body. And even if you were so passionate about the strength of your body, yes. And here we're talking of excess strength. It is your Islamic duty to maintain the good health of your body, definitely. It is your Islamic duty to tone yourself, keep yourself fit so that you can fulfill the obligations to Allah. But here we are talking of going beyond the limit. Brothers and sisters, are we, are we oblivious of the fact that death could come to us before we can enjoy watching that muscle in the mirror. Do you know that? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And this is why when you prepare one, make sure you know which one is more important to prepare. And this you will find from the stories of the previous nations. Allah says to Qarun, did he not see that we destroyed those before him who had more power than him? They were more powerful. They had more wealth than him. Yet he had so much wealth that the Quran says it was difficult for those with much energy, a group of people, men with much energy, to lift up the keys to the treasures of Qarun. 
وآتيناه من الكنوز ما إن مفاتحه لتنوء بالعصبة أولي القوة We gave him so much in terms of treasure that just the keys to the treasures were quite heavy for a group of men to lift. Allahu Akbar. We don't even have that much. And Allah says to him, we gave others before you more than that. Allahu Akbar. And still we destroyed them. So Allah reminds us, brothers and sisters, you can be very wealthy. Allah says, you will only benefit from your wealth if you turn to me. You can be very good looking. Those good, lookings are of, those good looks are of no use unless you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can be a person who is extremely intelligent. That intelligence is no point, no use unless you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reminders come and they come on a daily basis, wallahi. And we see the previous nations. Allah says, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ انظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And in another place he says, مُكَذِّبِينَ Go and travel on the earth and look at how the end of those who were sinful has been. Go and see their ruins. Go and look at where they are. Learn a lesson from them. See what has happened to them. Subhanallah. So we ask the Almighty to grant us lesson. Nuh alayhi salatu was salam was told that after this point, nobody will believe. So don't worry about what they're doing. Fala tabta'is bima kanu ya'malun. Don't worry. From now on, what they do. وَصْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا وَوَحِينَا We would like you to build the ark. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him to build the ark. And at that point, he stopped calling the people towards the deen. He left them. They used to laugh at him. They used to tell him, Oh Nuh, you were a prophet of Allah and now you've become a carpenter. They literally told him that. You were a prophet of Allah and now you've become a carpenter. Allah says, don't worry. Let them laugh. Let them scoff. A day will come when they will realize. So much so that if you look at Ad and you look at the people of Nuh, you will find when the punishment was coming, they did not recognize initially that this is the punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Ad. Allah says, إِذْ أَنذَرَ قَوْمَهُ بِالْأَحْقَافِ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ النُّذُرُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ When he warned his people, Hud alayhi salatu wasalam warned his people at the sand dunes about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. They did not take heed. They did not turn. And when the punishment came, what did they say? They said, هَذَا عَارِضٌ مُمْطِرُنَا Oh, these clouds are going to come with much rain that is needed for us. And Allah says, بَلْ هُوَ مَا اسْتَعْجَلْتُمْ بِهِ رِيحٌ فِيهَا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Allah says, no. This is actually the punishment that has come in the form of severe winds that hold within them a very painful punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So sometimes we look at things that may appear a blessing. But if we are away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are not concerned about pleasing our maker, perhaps what appears to be good to us might in fact be a means of punishment for us. May the Almighty not do that to us. But he has done it to those in the past. So what makes us people who think that we are secure from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? أَفَأَمِنَ أَهْلُ الْقُرَىٰ Several verses in the Quran where Allah asks a question about the people of the towns. Allah says, do they feel secure against the punishment of Allah? Do they think that the punishment cannot come to them whilst they are lying down or sleeping or perhaps oblivious, whether it is in the daytime or in the nighttime? You and I know there have been nations who have been destroyed. There have been cities that have been destroyed. Whilst they were asleep at night, they did not get up. Some of them, whilst they were playing in the afternoon, Allahu Akbar. What makes me certain that that will not happen to me? But wallahi, if I am on the right page, and if I am trying to please my maker, then by the will of Allah, that will be a means of my entry into paradise and not a means of my destruction. 
And this is why today we have calamities that befall people. Some people, for them, it is a means of punishment. And some people, the same calamity is a means of the mercy of Allah. Like we said, if a calamity brings you close to Allah, it is a tapping from Allah to draw you close. My worshipper, I sent you so many reminders you did not turn to me. My worshipper, here is a tapping. Today you saw an earthquake. Now you've come to me. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes so happy with the repentance of a worshipper of his. That the description is in the hadith. It's amazing. He becomes happier than a man who has lost his camel in the middle of the desert which had all his provisions in it. Look at this description. It's in the hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ says, a man in the middle of a desert who had his camel that he put and he perhaps went to lie down. That camel had all his provisions and the camel was lost. When he got up, no camel. And he is now worried because his food, his drink, his existence in this vast desert of his. No hope because everything is gone. The camel is over. And after some time of searching, he finds the camel. And out of extreme excitement and happiness, he says, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my worshipper. Imagine he made a statement that was the other way around. That was the excitement, the happiness of this particular person. So happy, so excited. Allah says, or the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah becomes more pleased when any one of us turn to him in repentance. Allahu Akbar. You want to please Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala, quit your adultery, quit it. It is easy and it can be done. There is privacy and it is very easily facilitated. But if you quit it only because you say, Inni Allah, Allah will give you the shade of the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. And you make him happy. Quit the sin that you're involved in. Quit the laziness that you're involved in. Turn to Allah. Read your five salah a day. A Muslim and he does not read five salah. Allahu Akbar, how can that be, my brothers and sisters? If you have read one in the past and now you are reading two, it's a very big improvement. But that is not still the ideal. You need to continue because as Muslimin, we have khamsa salawatin fi kulli yawmin wa layla. If you look at the hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal, radiallahu an, when he was sent to Yemen, he was told to teach the people several items from amongst them. One of them was tell them they owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five daily prayers, not two, not three. You know, we word it differently. When we speak to the younger people, sometimes we tell them, you know, you need a key to enter. For example, let's say paradise. You want to enter paradise, you need a key. You want to enter this door, you need a key. Each key has a number of teeth. Just like if I want to phone you, I need your phone number. Brother, if I have one error in the whole phone number, I won't get through to you. You see? So if I would like paradise, I need to read five salah on a daily basis. That is the figure. That's the number of teeth on the key. If you have one tooth missing, what happens? Try it. Take your key and break out one tooth. Put it in. It won't open your door. But there are so many other teeth. One is missing. My brothers and sisters, against your laziness or mine against the coziness of your bed against whatever you are doing in the mall or at your workplace or enjoying with your family stop everything at the time of salah and quickly fulfill your salah imagine i'm saying quickly whereas by right it's not supposed to be done quickly but even if you have done it in the midst of your work and you have fulfilled that salah, come what may, wallahi that may just be the means of your entry into paradise. Allahu Akbar. We learn this from the stories of the previous prophets. Whenever they were given instruction, their people who followed those instructions were granted mercy. Allah says, we saved him and those who were with him. Those who obeyed the instructions were saved. Allahu Akbar. We saved those who believed and who used to be conscious of us, who used to be fearful of us, and who used to be hopeful in our mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us hope in His mercy, and may He make us from amongst those who understand and realize. 
from amongst the stories of the prophets, we will come across matters that affect us on a daily basis. We spoke about usurping the wealth of others. How dare we usurp the wealth of others? If that happens, we would be punished in the same way the people of Shu'aib were punished. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has reiterated every single one of those aspects. And this is why one day he went out into the market and he put his hand into a set of dates, a pile of dates that there was in the market. And these dates from the top were looking quite nice. And as he put his hand inside and he found balal, balal meaning it was wet. You know, the low quality date was at the bottom and the top quality, the show was at the top. And he looked and he says, Ma hadha ya sahib at ta'am. What is this? O man who is selling this food item, what is it that you are doing? He says, Man ghashana falaysa minna. Whoever deceives us is not from amongst us. May Allah protect us from deception when it comes not only to business, but anything else in this world. Deception is not the quality of a true believer. Some people want to get married and they lie, they deceive and they cheat the spouse to be to the degree that only after marriage you find out this person has a major defect. Allahu Akbar. Why we cheat? Why do we deceive? May Allah protect us. And this is why Islam has come to the rescue of a spouse who has been falsely duped into marriage without knowing the proper condition of the person. Perhaps they would be able to apply for a nullification of that particular marriage through the correct channels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our men and women. May he grant us happiness. So as we were saying, if you open the stories of the prophets, you will come across the fact that some of them had children who did not listen to them. Allahu Akbar. Some of them had spouses who did not listen to them. You have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was one who did not have parents. His father passed away before his birth. And his mother passed away when he was very young. This is a lesson for us here. A person who is an orphan has a standing higher than an ordinary person. Because the hadith says, Ana wa kafilul yatimi kahataini fil jannah. Myself and the one who looks after, brings up an orphan, will be like this in paradise. And the two fingers he brought together, the first and the next. And it is good news to those who are orphaned that that's not the end of the world. Allah has chosen the best of creation to be an orphan. Allahu Akbar. So it's not the end of the world. And at the same time, those of us who have lost children in their infancy or family members, remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost all of his children, every single one of them, male and female, besides one girl, the daughter of his Fatima radiallahu anha. She was the only one who outlived him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The rest of them passed away in his life, all of them. The boys in a young age, young age, some of them infancy and childhood, all of them in fact. And the, the girls grew up, they passed away in front of his eyes, which means whilst he was still alive. So brothers and sisters, if you were to learn a lesson from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you would know how to react to that type of issue if it happened in your life. If Allah chose for the best of creation to go through something of that nature, definitely there is something special about you perhaps. Allah is giving you a chance to get closer to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us closeness to him. If you look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his character and conduct, that is all part and parcel of the stories of the prophets. All of the messengers had exemplary character. They never gave up hope. They spoke with utmost respect to their enemies. Look at Musa alayhi salam. Allah says, Go to Fir'aun, the two of you. Go and tell Fir'aun, the two of you, go and speak to him with soft language, with beautiful, palatable language, the language that can be digested. Perhaps he may take heed, he may be reminded, he may take the reminder. If you were to speak palatably. You know what we learn from this? Something very powerful. The question I ask you today. Do we have anyone in our midst or on the globe. Whom we can say is alive today. Who is better than the prophet Moses may peace be upon him. The answer is no. And do we have anyone who is worse than Fir'aun today. 
we might have fara'ina of today, people who are tyrants of today, perhaps they are there. But the Fir'aun himself was worse. We cannot say someone today worse than that Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a Nabi to him. So what we need to learn is, if Allah is telling someone who is better than me and you, to go to someone who is worse than the worst of our enemies, and speak to them with soft words. What about us? How do we talk to the non-Muslims? How do we talk to the enemies of Islam? How do we talk to our own family members? Subhanallah. Sometimes we are rough. Allah is telling this Prophet, go to the worst man and speak to him kindly, nicely. Allahu Akbar. We go to better people and we speak worse. Allahu Akbar. Look at it. Where is the logic? What lesson did I learn from the stories of the prophets? This is why I say we read the story. But did we take the lesson home? Did I currentize it and put it into my current life? Did I look at how it affects me? Am I guilty of being a person who knows all the stories? If I were to tell you name me 10 prophets, perhaps we would be able to name them. If I were to tell you what happened in brief regarding this prophet or that one, perhaps we would be able to say that. But if I were to tell you, brothers and sisters, how many of us have learned lesson from the lives of these prophets and applied it in my life and yours. We would have to think and we would have to go one by one, read the story passage by passage. Stop and ask yourself, how does this affect me today? How? If you don't know, go and find out. Ask those with knowledge. You know, I read this. I want to know how it affects me today. Sometimes it is just a lesson to learn. And sometimes it is applicable in your life. And this is why if you take a look at Surah Yusuf, a beautiful story, you find how brothers were jealous of their own brother. And a powerful lesson that we learn from the story of Surah Yusuf, when you plan the downfall of someone else, perhaps the very plan that you have hatched will result in that person being elevated. We see it so many times. You go to a workplace, one man is jealous of you, so he starts going to the boss and telling him tales about you and he does not want you to be promoted and so on. Perhaps his tale will make the boss conscious of your work and result in you being promoted higher than him. Allahu Akbar. It can happen. Don't lose hope. But if you were the one who is planning against others, take a look at what happened to the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. They said, قَالُوا تَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ آثَرَكَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَإِن كُنَّا لَخَاطِئِينَ They said, by Allah, Allah has indeed favored you over us. He raised you above us and we were the ones who were wrong. Their plan was to drop him below them. And Allah's plan was to raise him above them. And that is exactly what Allah did. But the plan of Allah was only going to be executed through the plotting of those who plotted against him. Had it not been for the plot of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, would he have then gone where he went and arrived at the end where he actually arrived? That's a question. So do not become depressed by something that might appear negative in your life. It is only temporary negativeness. It is only a temporary inconvenience. Perhaps a year later, a decade later, a few decades later, Allah has written for you ultimate success. My brothers and sisters, this is the success of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He owns it and he gives it to whomsoever he wishes. Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. We learn much from that. At the end of the story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ What a powerful verse. Allah says, indeed, in their stories, talking of the stories of the prophets, in their stories, are lessons to be drawn for those with intellect. Are we not claiming to be those of intellect? We will only be those of intellect if we draw lessons from the stories of the messengers. Allah says, indeed in their stories are lessons for those with intellect. 
These tales, they are, they are not fabricated tales. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى It is not statement or speech that is just fabricated. No, it is in fact the truth. And that which is in the Qur'an is indeed the truth. The Qur'an is not made up of tales. Allah would never ever make mention of these stories if there was no point behind mentioning them. And this is why Allah has chosen which messengers to mention in the Qur'an and which not to mention. He knows what we as the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would need. So my brothers and sisters, we have a lot to learn. Primarily, we need to know وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اِعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ That is the most powerful message we have. Allah says, we sent to every nation messengers to warn them, to tell them to worship Allah alone and to protect themselves from the devil and the devil's plan and anything that is earning the anger and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala top of the list is association of partners with Allah. That is the top of the list. And as I mentioned today in the Jumu'ah talk, Wallahi, a very important point. Ask yourself, why did Allah send the messengers? He sent the messengers to show us how to worship Him. That's what He sent the messengers for. So if we believe that and we understand that, Allah sent the messengers to show us how to worship Him, Will we be able to engage in innovation? The answer is no. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation, was held until he was known as the last Nabi. If Allah wanted, he could have sent him to another nation. But Allah sent him to us in order to show us how to worship Allah and in order to give us the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I come up with an act of worship that I claim is going to please Allah, and if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not teach it and did not do it, then I am undermining this great messenger, either by claiming indirectly that he forgot to teach us something, or that I know better than him, or that he has deceived Allah by not conveying a message that was supposed to be conveyed. Na'udhu billah. May Allah protect us from that type of behavior and from innovation. So this is why when people talk of innovation, remember brothers and sisters, people will be divided into two categories. Those who get upset. Well, look at what happened to those who got upset in the past. When you are called towards Allah and His Rasul, what happens is, People become upset. Why is this man saying this is an innovation? Ask yourself, is it an innovation? If it is, drop it, cut it out. No matter how tasty it was. No matter how tasty it is. An innovation needs to be dropped and cut. Because look at those in the past who innovated. What happened? They were considered as people who were not obedient to the messengers. They were ultimately destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the point of sending the messenger? If I knew better than the messenger what to do? So this is why shaitan comes to us just like he did to the previous nations and he tries to massage us and to make this innovation so sweet. No, but I'm only doing this, you know. I'm only doing that. It can only be good. You know, it is only that. One day somebody asked me a very interesting question. They said, I have been afflicted with a certain type of a sickness. And I have heard that if you read a specific word, I think it was 3,333 times you will be cured. But that must be read within 10 minutes. Wallahi, I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. And I thought to myself, brothers and sisters, you make dua to Allah. It's more powerful than anything. You raise your hands and say, Ya Allah, I have a problem, help me. It's so powerful. You are calling out to your maker. But make sure you are on one page because the hadith speaks of a man who is desperate, who calls out to Allah, but malbasuhu haram, mashrabuhu haram, ghuddiya bil haram, fa anna yustajabu li dhalik. You know, his clothing is haram, his food is haram, his drink is haram. Allah says, How does he expect us to respond to that call? Still, sometimes out of the mercy of Allah, he responds. My brothers and sisters, when we have a problem, sometimes it's a gift of Allah to make sure we check. Is my food halal? Is my income halal? Is my clothing halal? Is my drinking halal? Is my 
a relation with Allah, a good relation. Subhanallah. I always give the example of, you know, people who have high positions in a company. If someone tells you, brother, you know what? Uh, I am the main director of this company. You know, we'll greet them. And you greet them nicely because you know one day I might want a job there. Allahu Akbar. One day I might need something there. You know, a man comes to you and he tells you, you see, we have what is known as sahir. I, I don't know what you call it here, but these uh, uh, speed traps that you have and the little traps that you have at the traffic lights and so on. If a man comes to you and tells you, you know, I'm the director of all of that. Oh, we make sure. What's your phone number, sir? Why? Because I might just want to squash some of my fines, you know. I was rushing and so on. Allahu Akbar. So we might want to have a good link with the man because we know one day we might need him to squash a fine. My brothers and sisters, we are fools if we do not develop a link with our maker. Not only is it the squashing of a fine, but it is through his mercy that we will be saved from hellfire. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So if you do not have a link with Allah and you are not interested in developing your relation with your maker, and you think YOLO, you know what is YOLO? I don't know here in Qatar if you know that. But there is a cult across the globe now with the young. They are saying you only live once, YOLO. So they say I live by YOLO, which means I'm in the club every night. I'm on drugs, I drink, I may be gay or lesbian and so on. YOLO, you live only once. Today, in the Jumu'ah, I said and I repeated it again. And perhaps I tweeted it and I said, those who think you only live once, you actually live every day. But you only die once. Allahu Akbar. You die once. So prepare for the hereafter. Every day we sleep, we get up in the morning. Alhamdulillahi ladhi ahyana. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank him for giving us this life again. Ba'dama amatana. After he has caused the sleep. And here the term maut is used for sleep. Subhanallah. But... The statement being made is, do not think for a moment that, you know, I only live once, so let me enjoy, commit adultery, go to the clubs, drink, go, be on drugs, you know, go and listen to this and that. I was speaking, I think it was yesterday or the day before with one of the brothers. It was last night. And we were discussing musicians. And how, have you ever studied the lives of the top musicians of the globe? Every one of them their lives have ended in a very sad way. They either were suicidal, depressed, they died of drug abuse, they were probably infested in gay, they were very sad people. Why? Why? It is very simple. They call towards Taghut, they call towards Shaitan, they call towards immorality. They will pay for it unless they turn to Allah. We know of musicians who've turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People who have come onto the path. But if you study the lives of these people, if there was something good in it, you would not be able to notice the devil in the eyes of these people. It's not difficult. If you look at someone and you know they are involved in much evil, you will be able to see the evil in their faces. Subhanallah. It's not difficult. The way they dress, the way they paint, those people live by YOLO. We live by you do. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us prepare for the day we die. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many stories, so many examples. The other day someone was asking me, you know, you mention a few jokes in your talk sometimes. Brothers and sisters, these are not jokes. These are actually examples. Examples of a lighter kind. Sometimes, you know, you have a lesson you draw from it. So it's an example. It may be something that is abstract. It may be something that did not occur. But at the same time, what you need to realize is the lesson that we draw from some of these examples. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِن كُلِّ مَثَلِ Indeed, in this Quran, for man, we have given so many different examples because man automatically would relate to the examples that they are given. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is full of examples. The example of the camel, the example of a nation, the example of a man building a, a, building a, a, a building and leaving one brick and so on. These are so many examples given in the hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ. But without drawing the lesson from those examples, we would be failing. So sometimes people might remember the joke of the parrot, but if they don't remember the lesson derived from the joke of the parrot, then they have lost that example totally. They have lost it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from bad habits. Really, 
I appreciate the fact that we are here to learn something, to draw closer to the Almighty. May Allah grant us the ability to come back again and again to learn. Remember, every time we try to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are actually investing in our life after death. We are investing in our life after death. Today after Jumu'ah, one of the brothers was telling me that imagine if a person were to be saving up all his life, his money, and he saved, according to him, he has saved two, three million. And he goes to the bank and he says, what is my balance? And they say, your balance is zero. How will he feel? Sometimes we as human beings, our deeds are so far from the deen and we have innovated and associated partners with Allah to the degree that we think we've done so much good. But when we go to see the bank balance, it is zero. Allahu Akbar. Why? Allah says, Akhsarina a'malan. Those who are at greatest loss of their deeds. They lost their deeds. Brother, you did. Look at Surah Al-Ghashiyah. Hal ataka hadith al Have you seen the one who has cheated? Allahu Akbar. Being cheated and cheated. Allah describes how they would have done so many deeds and their faces would be humbled, but they will be going to hell. Why? Because of the same reason. They wasted their deeds in one way or another, either by association of partnership with Allah or by innovation or by having wronged someone. They did not learn a lesson from the people of the past. And they did not see what happened to the people of the past. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all lesson. May Allah open our doors. We hope and pray that this evening we have gone through how to currentize the stories of the previous messengers to the degree that we make them be of meaning within our own lives and to implement the gist that is implementable in our own lives. Like we said, and we concentrated a little bit more on the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. We ask the Almighty to help us. I'd like to end making mention of one point, the point of Nuh alayhi salam telling his people, do you want sustenance? Do you want children who will be the coolness of your eyes? He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he complained, قُلْ تُسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I told my people, Repent to Allah. Turn to Allah. He is most forgiving. Ghaffar is used in the Arabic language to depict one who is very, very forgiving. Ghaffar, one who forgives a lot. So Nuh alayhi salam says, I told them, seek the forgiveness of Allah. What will it do for you? He says, I told them what it will do for them. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدَرَارًا As a result of your istighfar, as a result of you seeking forgiveness of Allah, He will send beneficial rain to you. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And He will extend to you and grant you lots of sustenance and wealth as a result of you seeking forgiveness. And that wealth which comes with blessing, not with destruction. Some people when they get a million Riyal, they will fly to Thailand to commit sin. But others, when they get a million riyal, they will use half of it to build a little masjid somewhere in Africa, perhaps. Or to do something constructive. So Allah says, wealth which will come with blessing. And banin means he will grant you offspring as well. Who is the owner of offspring? What type of offspring do you want? You want banina shuhudan. You want children who will be around you when you grow old. You don't want children who are going to be really a means of your temper and anger whenever you see them and a means of making you upset. And he will, he will cause for you gardens, plush gardens he will grant you. And not only the gardens of paradise, but even in this world, he will give you the beauty of the scenes and the scenery and so on. And he will grant you rivers and so on. So this is what istighfar does. This statement was uttered by Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, but it is applicable in my life and yours. You want sustenance? Ask Allah's forgiveness. He will grant you sustenance. You want goodness? You want children? You want pious offspring? Become on the same page with Allah. 
which means try to be on that right path and you will find everything falling in slowly but surely it will come in sometimes it might come overnight and sometimes it might take a little bit of time no matter what the case it will definitely come by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he grant us goodness and may he open our doors until we meet again we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk